Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Michael Becker, and his topic is real-time predictive analytics using Scikit-Learn and RabbitMQ. Thanks, everybody. So uh, thanks for coming out. My name is Michael Becker. Uh, I work for the Data Analysis and Management Ninjas at AWeber. AWeber is an email a uh, service provider located just outside of Philadelphia with over 120,000 customers. If you've never heard of AWeber before, that's cool. Um, we're the company with the empty booth downstairs. So anybody else from the uh, Philadelphia area? OK. So I'm also the founder of the Data Philly Meetup with over 600 members. If you're not already a member, well, shame on you. So you can find me on Twitter. I'm uh, at BeckerFuffle. My blog is BeckerFuffle.com. And I'll probably post a blog uh, post on my website with uh, follow-up material. Oh, and uh, also you can find uh, these slides and other material on my GitHub. So working on the DAM team at AWeber, I've uh, introduced several predictive algorithms into our application. My coworkers think that I'm some sort of math superhero, reading scholarly papers by day and fighting crime by night. The truth is much more sinister. Fortunately for me, I don't have to be a math genius to look like a superhero. I just have to use scikit-learn. Um, so while I'll cover some math in this talk, I'll mainly be keeping things high level. And this is because I'm not a math genius. Um, the developers of scikit-learn are math geniuses. And if I get any of the math wrong, feel free to call me out on the internet. So this talk will cover a lot of the logistics behind utilizing a trained scikit-learn model in a real-life production environment. I'll start off by giving a brief overview of supervised learning, machine learning and text processing with scikit-learn. I'll cover how to distribute your model. I'll discuss how to get new data to your model for prediction. I'll introduce RabbitMQ and why you should care. I'll demonstrate how we can put all of this together, together into a finished product. I'll discuss how to scale your model. And finally, I'll cover some additional things to consider when using scikit-learn models in a real-time uh, production environment. So, the demo in this talk, I, I will, I'm going to demonstrate a supervised learning algorithm. So let's start off by defining what the training process looks like for a supervised model. So you start off with some input that may or may not be numerical. For example, you might have text documents as input. You also have labels for each piece of training data. You vectorize your, your training data, which means converting it to a numerical form. Then you train your machine learning algorithm using your vectorized training data and the labels as input. So this is all, often referred to as fitting your model. And at this point, you have a model that can take a new piece of unlabeled data and predict the label. So again, you need to vectorize your new data point. Then you input it into your trained algorithm. And your algorithm will spit out a predicted label for this new data point. There's other types of machine learning algorithms, but today I'll be concentrating mainly on supervised learning. So in this talk, I'm going to demonstrate one of the first models I ever created. And it's a model that predicts language for input text, of input text. And at the time, I needed a way to identify the language of content created by our customers. So to create this model, I used 38 of the top Wikipedias based on the number of articles. And I dumped several of the most popular articles from each of these Wikipedias. So going back to my diagram from before, the first thing we need to do is vectorize the text. So to start off, I converted the wiki markup to plain text. And I had read about this approach online that worked well for language classification. Um, basically, it involves counting all the combinations of n character sequences in a data set. And 
These are commonly called n-grams, and n-grams are a lot easier to understand if you visualize them, so let me show you an example. So to generate this word cloud, I downloaded six of H.G. Wells' books from Project Gutenberg, and here's what War of the Worlds looks like if we visualize the raw word counts for each word. And you can accomplish this with one line of scikit-learn. So the size of the word is based on the number of times a word shows up in, a, in the book. One thing you'll notice looking at the text is that the word Martians occurs about as frequently as the word, words people and time. And this is counterintuitive. Uh, you think that Martians are much more important to world the worlds than these other words. So fortunately, there's another algorithm called TFIDF which, that can help solve this problem. So TFIDF stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency, and it reflects how important a word is to a specific document in a collection of documents. So the TFIDF value increases based on the number of times an n-gram appears in a specific document, but this is offset by the frequency of the n-gram in the rest of the documents. So in this example, a document is one of the six H.G. Wells books that I downloaded. And what you'll notice here is the word Martians is comparatively bigger because it was weighted higher than more commonly words, again, like people and time. And this is because Martians are important to the book War of the Worlds. And However, uh, TF, TFIDF does have some trade-offs on very large corpuses of text. It, may, it might not be computationally practical, um, but for my particular classifier, I ended up using TFIDF because it increased the accuracy of my model by about 1%, and every percentage counts. So let's see how to put this all together with a simple classifier. Uh, we call this type of algorithm a classifier because you provide some input text and it classifies it as one of multiple classes. So in the case of my algorithm, you provide some text as input and it will classify the, uh, the language of the text. And to start off, I defined a pipeline combining a TFID TFIDF vectorizer with a SVC classifier. So a pipeline is a utility used to build a composite classifier. The TD, TFIDF vectorizer converts the Wikipedia articles to numerical form. The vectorizer first counts the number of occurrences of each n-gram in each document to vectorize the text. It then applies the TFIDF algorithm, and then the pipeline understands how to connect the output of the vectorizer to the input of the classifier. So all that's left to do is to fit our data to our model, um, which is the last line. And let's take a closer look at X-train and Y-train. So X train is the portion of my data that I set aside for training. Generally speaking, you don't want to train an algorithm using your full data set because many algorithms can suffer from an issue called overfitting. Overfitting is when a model is very good at making predictions about your training set, but when presented with new data, it performs poorly. Scikit-learn has tools built in to help avoid overfitting. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail during my talk, but there's plenty of details in the scikit-learn docs, so check those for more details. Um, Xtrain is an array of text from the Wikipedia articles. Besides stripping out the wiki markup, I don't do anything else to, pre to prepare the data. Um, the vectorizer handles converting the text to the numerical form required by the SVC algorithm. OK, so Y-train is the labels for our training set. So in this code here, Y is a one-dimensional array. In this case, it contains the language of each article. Unlike X-train, I, I do need to convert these to numerical form prior to passing them to the fit method. So for each Wikipedia, so to do that, I can, you can use the, a label encoder, and what that does is it assigns a numerical value to each of your inputs. And for each Wikipedia page in X-Train, there is a corresponding label in Y-Train. So one trick I often use when dealing with text data, which speeds up the training process and lowers memory consumption, is to use a technique called 
dimensionality reduction. So dimensionality reduction is the task of deriving a set of new abstract features that is smaller than the original feature set while retaining most of the variance, variance of the original data. One such algorithm for doing this in scikit-learn is randomized PCA. So PCA, which stands for principal component analysis, allows you to re-express a set of data points in terms of basic components that explain the most variance in the data. So in this case, we've specified that the number of new features should be 50. It's easy to add PCA to my classifier. I just have to add it to the pipeline. So let's break down the pipeline so that we can see what's really going on under the hood. So if we just run the vectorizer by itself, it produces a data set with over one million features. Uh, because this is text data, the data set is sparse. This is because each column in our data set represents an n-gram that was seen in at least one of the documents. And for any given document, most of these n-grams will have a count of zero. So let's see what happens when we run PCA on the data set. OK, so now we've decreased the number of features from over a million to 50. But how can we be certain this won't negatively impact the accuracy of our final classifier? The PCA algorithm has a parameter called explained variance ratio that calc that's calculated during the fitting process. You can see, or you can use this to see if you've picked a good value for n components. We can see by adding all these values together that we've retained almost all of the var variance from the original data set all while significantly decreasing the size of the input to our classifier. So this is really awesome. But one last thing. Don't use randomized PCA on sparse matrices, such as those output by TF-IDF vectorizer. So there's another algorithm called truncated SVD, which was designed to work efficiently on sparse matrices. And su support for them will be dropped from randomized PCA in a future release of scikit-learn. So I use randomized PCA here because truncated SVD doesn't currently calculate the explained variance ratio, but it will probably be added in a future release. So one last tip before I move on. Scikit-learn comes with a ton of algorithms built in, and many of them have multiple parameters you can tweak. It can be daunting to figure out which algorithm to use and what values to pick for the parameters. Luckily, there are a lot of tools built into Scikit-learn to help you tune your model so that you get a, the best performance out of it. I recommend randomized search uh, CV. You give, it some random, you give randomized search a range of values to try for each parameter, and then it randomly chooses some of the values and tests them. Once the search is complete, you can get the highest scoring classifier along with its score and parameters. And you can easily run this kind of search on multiple algorithms to figure out which one will perform best for your particular data set. All right. So now that you have this awesome model, now what? One of the first problems you'll want to solve is how to distribute your model. The recommended method for distributing your model is to use the built-in pickle module to serialize the model to disk and to distribute it as, part of, as your, part of your application. So you can store it in a database such as GridFS or Amazon S3. In the case of my model, it took up roughly 200 megabytes in memory. This is pretty big, but it's easily storable on, on disk and, more importantly, in memory. So one caveat of this approach is if you upgrade scikit-learn, your pickled model is not guaranteed to work. So it's very important that you keep detailed records of your training set and your model's training parameters if you want to be able to upgrade scikit-learn in the future. So take care when upgrading scikit-learn in production to make sure you're not going to break your application. All right, next let's discuss how we're going to get data into our model. So your data could be coming from many types of sources a web front end, a database trigger. In many cases, you can't easily control the rate of incoming data, and you don't want to hold up the front end or the database while you wait for a prediction to be made. In these cases, it's useful to be able to process your data asynchronously. So in the example I'm giving today, we created a simple web front end, similar to Google Translate, where a user can enter some text to be classified and get a classification back. We don't want to hold up a thread or process in the client waiting on our classifier to do its thing. So rather, the front end sends input to a REST API, which will record the text input and return a tracking ID that the client can then use to get the result. There are several other ways we could design this, but for 
our particular application, this design works fine. So decoupling the UI from the back end in this way solves one design issue. However, another thing to consider is whether you can afford to lose messages. If all of your data needs to be processed, you have two options. You can either build in a retry mechanism on your front end, or you need a persistent and durable queue to hold your messages in the back end. So enter RabbitMQ. One of the many features provided by RabbitMQ is highly available queues. By using RabbitMQ, you can ensure that every message is processed without needing to implement a fancy and likely error-prone retry me mechanism in your front end. So RabbitMQ uses AMQP, which stands for Advanced Message Queuing Protocol for all client communications. Using AMQP allows clients running on different platforms or written in different languages to easily send messages to each other. From a high level, AMQP enables clients to publish messages and it allows other clients to consume those messages. It does all this without requiring you to roll your own protocol or library. For anyone who's new to AMQP, I would recommend you check out the Pika library, which has some pretty awesome documentation. Uh, RabbitMQ also has some pretty awesome resources on its site for beginners, and their blog is also a really excellent resource. Finally, for anyone who's interested in learning more about the nitty-gritty details of using RabbitMQ in a production environment, my coworker, uh, Gavin M. Roy, who is the maintainer of Pika, has an excellent book coming out called RabbitMQ in Depth. And Gavin, if you're in the audience, I am happy to accept a commission check. Finally, uh, if you don't like RabbitMQ, this kind of solution should work, pretty, work fine with pretty much any other message queuing, uh, any other message queuing system. So, Use whichever one you are familiar with. So once you hook the, the, your data input source into your message queuing system and you start publishing data, all you need to do is put your model in a persistent worker and start consuming input. In the case of my language classification model, we implemented a simple consumer. So first it unpickles the classifier and subscribes to an input queue. It then runs an event loop. And the event loop pulls new messages as, we be, as they become available and passes them to, the, to process event. Process event calls predict on our model and converts the numerical prediction to a human readable format. This prediction is then stored in our database, in this case uh, MongoDB, and for, for the front end to retrieve. So that's basically it. Our design looks a little something like this. The input comes from the UI where the user enters some text they wish to classify. The UI hits a Flask REST API via a GET request. The API stores the request in the database. The API then sends a message to RabbitMQ with the text to classify and the tracking ID for storing the resulting classification. The API returns a JSON response to the UI with the tracking ID. The consumer pulls the message off the queue in RabbitMQ. The consumer calls predict on the classifier with the text as input. The classifier returns a prediction, and then the consumer stores that prediction in the database. Finally, the UI displays the result. So there isn't really one right way to design a solution like this. For example, you could, instead of pull, having the UI pull the API, you could utilize something like WebSockets. All right, so let's see what this looks like in action. So I'm not, I want to start off by saying I am not a linguist. So, but I've read that Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, and Dutch use similar character sets, so I'm going to use them for my demo. All right, so this is what our front end looks like. Let's just test it out to make sure everything's working. Can, can everyone read it in the back? How's that? Oh, we can't see the result. How about that? <laughs> eh, all right. Well, it'll just have to do. So let's, let's test this out real quick. Hooray. All right. So let's do something a little more interesting. So. Uh, so I, as I said, I have some data in a few different languages here. Uh, let's start off with Danish. So 
I wanted to get some uh, information from in these different, four different languages, but I wanted them to be about the same topic. So what I did was I found news articles about the heart, be, uh, heart bleed uh, open SSL bug, bug in each of these four languages. So let's, let's see how our algorithm handles this. So this one, according to Google, is Danish. And it, we also think it's Danish. Sorry for the advertisements. Uh, this one is Swedish. We also think it's Swedish. This one is Norwegian. We also think it's Norwegian. And finally, Dutch. It's Dutch. All right. <clears throat> so besides the basic design concerns I've already covered, there are a few more things worth mentioning. The worst thing that can happen when you're processing data asynchronously is for your queue to, queue to back up. So backups will result in longer processing times. And if they're unbounded, you could crash RabbitMQ. So the easiest way to scale your consumers is to start another instance. Using this strategy, processing should scale roughly linearly. In my experience, you could easily handle thousands of messages a second this way. Also, if you want to prevent backups, consider using a RabbitMQ feature called TTL queues to detect and prevent backups. Another way to scale your consumer is to convert it to processing requests in batches. Many of the algorithms in scikit-learn scale super linearly when you pass multiple samples to their predict method. So the downside of this is that you will no longer be able to process results in real time. However, if you're restricted on resources and this trade-off is acceptable for your particular application, this might be a worthwhile alternative. Uh, keep an eye on your queues. Uh, the, their si the queue sizes and alert when they back up. So scale your consumers as needed, possibly automatically. You could use something like AWS Autoscale for that. Um, you can also monitor other things, such as how many consumers are connected to your queue, your message ingress and outgress rates, and other things. So understand your load requirements. Load test end-to-end -to, -end to verify that you can handle the expected load for your application. So a predictive algorithm is a lot like a piano. If it's not in tune, it's going to suck. So how do you make sure your predictive algorithm is performing well with new data? One solution is to periodically re-verify your algorithm using new data. Um, depending on your use case, this might not be easy to accomplish. So in the case of my language classifier, how would we collect new labeled data? Maybe we could add a button that allows users to report problems. Um, then we could go through some of these results and label them manually, and then retrain the algorithm against them. Another technique, um, which I, I, I'm sorry if I butcher your name, uh, which I learned from Olivia Grizzle, is to train a new classifier to predict new versus old data. So then if the accuracy of this classifier is high, maybe above 50 or 55 or 60%, uh, the distribution of your new data has drifted from your training set. So this means it's probably time to retrain your classifier with new data. In this scenario, you'd still need to label your new data before you could retrain your algorithm. So no matter how you handle tuning your algorithm, make sure that you version control your classifier and keep detailed change logs and performance metrics uh, on your, on, your, on your changes. All right, so I'd like to thank uh, Kelly O'Brien and Matt Park for helping me with the back end and the front end respectively for my demo. And thanks again for coming out to my talk. Here's my information if you'd like to get a hold of me. I, I'm Mike at BeckerFuffle.com if you'd like to email me.
Thank, thank you, Mike. If you have any questions for him, let's go ahead and form a line right here. Uh, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, get in line, ask him. I just was curious about how little text you could put in uh, as opposed to copy pasting the whole thing. Does it do okay with a paragraph or so? Um, so some, something to keep in mind is I didn't uh, tune my algorithm to work with small amounts of text because I, the training set was from Wikipedia, which are, and they were like the top articles in these Wikipedias, so they're generally larger. Um, I, I haven't tried tuning it for small text, but I can say from experience it doesn't work great on small inputs. So for example, when I tested it out at the very beginning, I gave his input hello world, and when I was getting ready for the presentation, I accidentally typed hello world with a capital W, and it thought it was Malaysian. So. Um, thank you very much for your talk and the uh, impressive library. Uh, my question is, um, do we, um, does this library support any distributed training? Because it's pretty critical uh, to train very large uh, data sets. Uh, so a lot of the algorithm supports uh, setting a parameter called n jobs, which uh, will scale across uh, CPUs. I'm not certain about uh, scaling across machines, um, but yeah, I would definitely, uh, I, I, by the way, I'm, I'm not one of the contributors to, to Scikit-Learn, but uh, I would definitely recommend like, asking that question on the Scikit-Learn mailing list. OK, thank you. Did you find that there were any languages or groups of languages that were particularly difficult to distinguish? Um, so the ones that I picked in my demo, I picked specifically because they were, there's at least two in that group that I chose um, that use the same character set. It's actually really not being a linguist, it's really hard to find languages that use the exact same character set. So, and if you try to look this up online, there's like all sorts of uh, noise out there. So um, I, I would say, in general, that I tried to pick the hardest uh, example possible. Um, hi, you mentioned that the way you save the model is through Pickle. Um, do you know if it supports other serialization systems? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. So prior to my talk, I actually uh, asked uh, Olivier, uh, what's the, is, is Pickle still the recommended way of uh, serializing your model? And uh, he, he let me know that, yes, it is. And he may have gone into a little more detail, but I'm, I'm forgetting right now. Um, so maybe. <laughs> Hi. So, uh, you talked about the problem of overfitting the model. Um, I've had a very similar problem with uh, classifying images in a pet project of mine. Um, do you have any recommendations to avoid it? Um, so there is a um, there's an algorithm that's part of Scikit-Learn called Extremely Random Forest, and at least according to the the, the papers that I've read, and keep in mind I'm not an expert, uh, if the papers claim that uh, extremely random forests are not as susceptible to overfitting, so I would recommend checking, checking that algorithm out. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Thanks for coming out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mike.